Uh, good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Uh, my name is Kathy Garretts, and I'm one of the curators here. Um, we're really delighted to be hosting. Uh, this is the second program in our um, Yuji Trinka series. I'm trying to learn how to say that name, but <laughs> doing my best. Uh, and we're really pleased that Jan Pinkaba is here uh, to introduce it. Uh, he's an Academy Award-winning director with a career in animation that spans 25 years uh, and includes being influenced by Trinka. Uh, he may be known to some of you from his uh, work locally at Pixar, uh, where he worked on um, projects f uh, for over 13 years, uh, ranging from directing the 1997 Oscar-winning short Jerry's Game, one of the very early Pixar pieces, um, and being the original creator of the Oscar-winning uh, 2007 feature film Ratatouille, which we were discussing up in the cafe. <laughs> Um, currently, he's the creative director of Google Spotlight Stories, um, a team of artists and technologi technologists who are creating new forms of immersive interactive stor storytelling for um, mobile and VR virtual reality. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about the series. It's a touring series. Um, we're near the end of it. Um, and we were able to select um, a number of programs from the uh, larger series to present here. Um, the tour is produced by Comeback Company. Uh, it originated at the Film Society at Lincoln Center in New York. And I want to mention and thank the curator, Irena Kovarova. And she's going to be here on Sunday um, at again with Jan Pinkaba, who will be introducing the screening. And I want to say that that program includes a beautiful uh, 35 millimeter archival print of Midsummer's Night Dream. So that would be one you might not want to miss. I also want to give a big thanks to the um, Czech National Film Archive for providing both the GCP restorations and the films. So um, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Jan Pinkova and welcome him to all of you. you. Hello, hello everybody. Um, what, a, what a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that wonderful introduction. I've stuffed the audience with my friends, so I hope it's not going to be a problem tonight. Uh, <laughs> hello. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk some embarrassingly for a few minutes, just a few, I, trust me, it won't be long. Uh, and then you can see these films, these four films we're going to show tonight. Um, where to begin? So I've been working in computer animation for a long time, and I'm Czech. I was born in Prague in 1963. Okay? And I was raised in a Czech-speaking household in the UK after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 made us leave, etc., etc. And um, like so many Czechs of my generation and many other generations, actually, I was hugely influenced by this guy here, Yuri Trinka. I'm actually here because I can pronounce his name properly. Um, and you too can do this if you try. Um, his name is Yuri Trinka. Now, that's very difficult. It, it's, uh, Yuri just means George in Czech. Um, and it contains this strange sound of the, which is unique to the Czech language, so it's a bit hard to do. Yuri. Trinka means um, blackthorn or slow, like the, the slow gin you make out of the, black, the fruit of the, black, the berries of the blackthorn bush. So his name is George Slow or George Blackthorn. And he was the son of a, uh, uh, of a plumber and a dressmaker, born, uh, born in 1912, before Czechoslovakia even existed, was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, he, as a child, you see, he looks like um, a hard case. He looks like a, a trucker or something, right? He, and you wouldn't imagine, looking at this man, that he, uh, he's one of the most sensitive artists that Central Europe has ever produced. Um, but he is, was. And uh, he, uh, he was influenced in his early childhood by a, a famous Czech puppeteer called Josef Skupa, who's well known to the old Czechs. And he sort of was steeped in the traditions of this centuries-old puppet theater of Central Europe. And then along came, what? Um, well, he, he was encouraged, his, Skupa encouraged his parents to send him to the Academy of, uh, uh, of Applied Arts in Prague, uh, where he, he learned his trade. But he was a, a practical artist who just worked like a dog all his life. He was, he was constantly working. You only see pictures of him never smiling, always with a, with a 
a, a, a cigarette in his mouth or holding it. And he came out of that school uh, straight into trying to make puppet theater work. Then along came the Second World Well, there was the Depression. There was the Second World War. There was, uh, there was, well, he was born into the First World War. After the Second World War, there was totalitarian communism. Not much to smile about. So he, he wasn't smiling very much. Um, but he, um, he was responsible in his own way for carrying a deeply important aspect of, of the Czech culture. Um, and he was a tremendously talented artist. He was, uh, as I say, a puppet maker in the puppet theater. He made his living as, a, as an illustrator to begin with. Um, he illustrated many, many books, about 130 books or more. Um, and uh, he, uh, he did his animation work in cell animation. He founded a, a company called Bratřiv Triku, uh, which is a weird Czech pun on words back uh, in the early, late 30s. And, um, and, and he eventually graduated to puppet animation, which was then his métier. And he made these wonderful films. Um, and... Um, I wanted to show you, before we see the film, some of his illustrations, because that's what he means, actually, mostly to most Czechs. So he was, this is the town that he ended up in. He was born in Bolzeň, which is where the Pilsner beer is invented and comes from. So it's, what could be more Czech than that? And then he, he came to Prague. This was the Prague of his youth. This is famous photographs by Karel Plitska, which are these sort of sepia-toned, beautiful, romantic images of Prague of the 20s and 30s which were the backdrop to, to Tunka's life, which is terribly poor and dreadful. And, um, and so he, uh, he uh, was most famous for, in all his output as, a, as an illustrator, for the definitive Hans Christian Andersen, which was uh, translated into more than 100 languages, if I'm not mistaken. And these are a, a few drawing uh, paintings from that. That's the, that's the tinderbox and the ugly duckling. And um, this was all over Europe. And the reason, um, let me say something about... Uh, Books. This scared the bejesus out of me when I was a small child. This is from, from the, uh, uh, the Emperor's Nightingale. Uh, and you can see how Prague affected him as well. Um, uh, under totalitarian communism, in the good old days of Stalinism in the 50s, um, everything was censored and controlled by the state. And uh, it turns out that this had an un un sort of an odd side effect. It meant that the, um, the people trying to avoid that spotlight of the party retreated to the periphery of, of uh, the artistic world and so on, and, and writing and, and, and so on. And one area that there was a relatively, they were sort of relatively left alone was in il children's books, publishing and illustrating children's books. It wasn't as, as under the spotlight of the party censorship and apparatus. And so what happened is that Trnka was among a very small handful of um, sanctioned uh, state artists who were allowed to work, and he was the first among equals, easily the best. And this group of brilliant artists illustrated, you know, collectively hundreds and hundreds of children's books. And really, what people of before my generation after didn't know that because of the terrible politics, we had the best artists in the country working for us, illustrating the books that we loved as children. So this was, a, you know, a, a weird side effect where the culture was was sort of withdrawing and. And, uh, and preserving itself for the future generations by giving the best stuff to the kids, which is really how it should be, isn't it? it won't, right? That, that's, that, in a way, an ideal thing. Not very good for the artists themselves, but as I say, Trnka uh, was, a, a, you, you'd call him a workaholic, but he, he never had to be employed because he was so prolific uh, and he produced so much that the people just sort of ran in his wake picking up his bits and pieces that he made and, and he was allowed to work. And he was one of the few sources of hard currency export for the communist regime. And his books and films were sold in the West for m real money. And that's another reason why he was left alone. Um, so um, and let me just show you a few more pictures. This is from the uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales, which illustrated A Thousand One Nights. Uh, there's the Jan Karafiad's Brochsi. It's, it's a very famous Czech story. All these uh, many, many, and he, and he made puppets and designed theater costumes and designed theater sets. And he, he was a fine artist as well later on. He did many, many paintings and pastels and, and drawings and what have you. Uh, his graphic work isn't even represented in these images. Uh, he was a sculptor. He tried to actually make it as a sculptor in later life. And uh, the Czechs wouldn't take him seriously and all this stuff was bought up by foreign collectors. Um, a tremendous eye, a unique. Here are some of his drawings and storyboards for 
uh, a project called uh, the, the Old Czech Legends, Staré Pogesti České, which is, a, you know, some of the, some of the traditional uh, or, or the, the 19th century re revival stories of Czech grandeur in the past. Uh, tremendously prolific artist. And um, is, I don't know if we've already screened uh, The Good Soldier Schweik, which is this one here on site. He, he, uh, he did uh, three, three shorts uh, with Jan uh, 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 Verich. Uh, uh, um, you don't know these people. Uh, we're going to see tonight... <laughs> We're going to see tonight, um, uh, on Sunday, before the, the main feature, which will be his Midsummer Night's Dream, the, the one on the top corner there is the Devil's Mill, which will be shown. And tonight, we're, one of the ones we're going to see is, uh, is the cybernetic grandmother, which I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, and here is from the uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. If you're free on Sunday, please come here, if, if not before, because this is a masterwork, a poetic interpretation of Shakespeare's classic uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a puppet theatrical way. And don't these actual theatrical uh, sets on under, under the camera look like illustrations in a book. Uh, he, ha he, he, he choreographed and, and, and designed all, all the work, um, a, a tremendous, tremendous work. So, and there he is, looking like a, a trucker, uh, <laughs> gently manipulating these puppets. This is the, the, the young girl in Cybernetic Grandmother. Um, just to give you an idea of how important Trnka was um, considered, uh, it was actually about 20 years ago, because of Jerry's Game and other things, that I was at the Pacific Film Archive Temporary Theatre up on Bancroft Avenue. And there was a small retrospective of Trinka back then. And I was lucky enough to meet uh, Yuri Trinka's daughter, one of his daughters. And she happened to be married to an eminent professor of jurisprudence and a, and a, a scholar and a lawyer, who, so it happens, was the author, one of the co-authors of the new Czech constitution after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Okay, so this great legal scholar and man who'd written the constitution of a country introduced himself to me and said, you know, people don't know me as the guy who wrote the constitution of their country. They know me as the husband of the daughter of Yuri Tenka. <laughs> Absolutely true. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of what this fellow meant to people. So we're going to see four films tonight. Uh, the first one... They sort of span, actually, the year I was born in 1963. Two from 1962, one in 64, and one in 65. A uh, couple of notes about them, just to put them in context for you, and then, then we'll watch them and I'll shut up. Um, the first one, Varsheng, translated as passion, or, or, or how else would you translate it, as an obsession. It's, it's about the need for speed. And he, I think I was actually a speed freak. He, he loved to drive his motorbikes and cars very, very fast. Uh, and maybe that was the reason for this thing. I don't know. Uh, and it's a sort of experimental, weird, uh, early 60s film. Very interesting. The, the Cybernetic Grandmother, from a story by Ivan Klima, an eminent Czech writer, um, is a meditation on the horrors of the tech future, which is absolutely current today, if you pay any attention to what's going on in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting uh, uh, sort of futurological story from the 60s about a little girl and her grandmother. And I'm sorry to say um, that I believe that in this digital print, the actual very final few shots are missing, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at least I saw this uh, in, in, in Portland uh, a couple of weeks ago, and unless it's been uh, amended, uh, you actually don't quite know how it ended. So I'm going to leave you to guess, when the screen goes black and you can still hear the sound, whether, whether it ended well or badly. And you'll get a sense of, it, of, the, of the idea from, from the, the film itself. And the, the music is not by Trenka's usual collaborator, Václav Trojan, but by a guy called Jan Horák, who, who gives it um, this very heavy, um, uh, uh, organic, organ uh, uh, sort of soundtrack. It's, it's really not, not light stuff. Um, so beware, prepare yourselves. Um, then there's, uh, uh, from 1964, the Archangel Gabriel and Mistress Goose, which is a salacious farce from uh, pre-Renaissance uh, Florentine Italy by uh, uh, Gius uh, uh, Giuseppe Giovanni Boccaccio from 1349, time of the plague, also bad time. I think I like bad times. Um, and it has a, it has a, um, uh, a little introduction in, in cutout, oops, sorry, cutout animation. And I think if you look at that and the date it was made, you might get a sense of where Terry, Terry Gilliam might have been inspired in his idiom for Python animation. Um, 
and it's it's a it's a it's a Renaissance fast and a bit salacious, so that could be fun. Finally, uh, the last thing is uh, the Hand, 1965, which purportedly was Trinka's favorite uh, film. And this is a very straight, on-the-nose meditation on state control of the artist's freedom. Uh, extremely explicit. And uh, it was actually tolerated by the, by the regime after it was made for some time. And only after the Soviet invasion of 1968 did it disappear completely and wasn't seen again until, uh, until uh, new times came. One more thing I'd like to say to you. that What's interesting about this, and um, I, I live in Portland, Oregon, where we have Leica studio, uh, like a entertainment, and they make wonderful stop-motion animated films, uh, using all kinds of new technology. All these films were made in the old, traditional stop-motion puppet animation way, which means somebody under a camera doing a very, very slow performance, moving a puppet, stepping out, taking a picture, moving a puppet a bit more. And as soon as that picture is taken on film, it disappears into the camera, is never seen again until it is processed and seen for the first time, and that's the one take they had. That's how these films were made. So the artists, the animators who made these films had to play the whole thing in their heads, get the timing right. It's a tremendously exacting art. So um, it's, it's uh, stupidly difficult. Uh, and these days, you have these things called frame grabbers, which show the animator the, the last few frames on video so they can get the next one in the right place to make everything flow and to make everything work well. Back then, it was all just in your head, one frame at a time. Bear that in mind as you, as you watch these films. I do hope you enjoy them. Um, one, one last thing to bore you more. Uh, when I was in, uh, at the Annecy Film Festival in, in France a few years ago, uh, Trenka's lead animator for some time, a guy called Bretislav Poyar, was the guest of honor. And nobody had ever heard of him. And he was wandering around like an old man, sort of uh, being ignored mostly, rather, rather tragically. Um, and he was, a, he was a great animator, and, and he had his own life and his own studio, and he, he emigrated to Canada and worked for the National Film Board for many years. And he sat, we sat down together for a chat, and I got a real insight into some of the attitude of the early Czech animation uh, uh, sort of culture. I always thought in my pretentious uh, Czecho-English way that, that, that these Central Europeans and these Czechs and these people I revered were sort of looked looked askance at the, uh, the idioms of America and Disney and so on, and they were perhaps seeing the saccharine treatments of these traditional fairy tales and what have you. So Poyar said, you know, in 1938, along came um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We were astonished. To me, he said, this is the perfect film. It, it combines the three pillars of, of filmmaking, drama, uh, comedy, and lyricism in perfect proportion. And we, we just were aghast. How can we possibly come even close to this because we can't match the resources or the dedication that Disney's and their studios have landed? We have to do something else. And they were knocked on their heels and stunned for, for years trying to figure out what to do. Trenka was their answer to Disney, which is why he was called the Czech Disney, which is nonsense. So there's, no, there's hardly any parallel at all. But this is kind of a small, landlocked European country's answer to Walt Disney, you might say, in a way. Okay, thank you very much and please enjoy the time.